Today we have some uh, very special guests. I was talking with Dr. Jerry Thornton, and I was also talking with Andrew Clark about uh, business's mission last spring. And we, uh, we had a really good discussion, and while we were discussing things, they brought up their star graduates, uh, Luke and Mallory Keller. They uh, have an organization called Amplio Recruiting that they're gonna tell you about. I'm, I'm super excited about what they're doing and the fact that they're here, and I'm going to just let them uh, introduce themselves. So y'all please welcome Luke and Mallory Keller. All right, thanks. I guess I'll take this off. That's all right. Um, so yeah, I'm Luke Keller. This is my wife, Mallory. We're just so thrilled to be back here. It's been a few years since we've been able to return to our alma mater. Um, our presentation is slightly going to be off because so we, if there's one thing we learned it's always be prepared and save your presentation in multiple places we learned that here and we did not do it so don't do what we do yeah so we, we actually over technology it with a new mac so it happens yep. but anyways so i know everyone's probably wondering a little bit more about us we did meet at sanford um my junior year, Luke's senior year, we actually had Dr. Holloway's marketing class together. Luke was my flag football coach, he played football, I was what Luke would call a nerd, and um, we ended up dating, we got married right after we graduated, and um, then Luke's job it was actually the springboard to a lot of what we're doing now. Yeah, and so um, I had the opportunity after college, after I finished, to um, head over to Abilene, Texas. I don't know if anyone knows ACU or Abilene well, but I was working for a construction engineering company, um, doing business development and uh, HR. And um, through that, had the opportunity to um, actually approach the CEO of the company, who was a believer about um, kind of doing more, doing business as missions. Um, we were about a half a billion dollar company at that point. And um, so I guess I inspired him because I, I uh, convinced him to let us move um, back to Atlanta, um, specifically to work in Clarkston. Um, within the refugee community um, to start what's called the Lantern Project, um, which is a nonprofit organization that does uh, certified construction trade training uh, primarily for refugees as a means of uh, economic development and empowerment. Um, yeah, so again, within the refugee community there in Clarkston. So we've got a few videos throughout this presentation that actually won't work, so I'm gonna let Luke verbally describe them when we get there. <laughs> and um, until then, we'll just move through everything. So I wanted to start with what is a refugee? I know there's a ton of preconceived notions about what one might be, and a lot of people don't know the actual definition. But a refugee is a person who's been forced to leave his or her country due to war, persecution, or a natural disaster. So most of these refugees, before they come to the U.S., are actually um, in refugee camps, whether inside their own country or a neighboring country. Um, then what happens is they can apply for status with an NGO to get over here. So when they come, they're given a special immigrant visa, an I-94, or some other form of a visa, and they're legal to work when they arrive, but they actually apply for a green card once they get here. So there are a couple of resettlement agencies that will help them, help them resettle when they get to the U.S., and they typically give them housing and a stipend for three to six months. Um, when they get here, it depends on the size of their family, the length of time that that assistance continues, and they usually are connected with a job. However, it's typically minimum wage, and it's not a great career, and the reason is resettlement agencies are incentivized by the government to resettle people quickly. So there's no thought of, on their part of what's best for the person moving forward. There's no thought about the working conditions or the pay. So. Some common misconceptions is what we're going to go over, some myths and some facts. So a common myth, refugees want to leave their country. The fact is refugees are forced to flee their homes due to war and persecution. So most of them don't want to leave their homes or their families, their careers, their lifestyles behind everything they work so hard for, but they're forced to just for the sake of wanting to live. And um, many of them, once they get here, they'd actually love to go back home when things get better. A lot of times they don't get better, but their desire is to actually just go back home. The next myth is that refugees are terrorists. Um, I think this could be the most common one. 
today. And the fact is that refugees are fleeing terror groups such as ISIS and Boko Haram themselves. So the process of obtaining refugee status in the US actually takes longer and is harder than becoming an FBI agent. So it entails multiple background checks, interviews from a ton of organizations, including Homeland Security. And um, they have to be interviewed, their family members coming, and then family members that are staying as well. The next myth is that refugees are a drain on society. So the fact is that refugees start businesses, work tough jobs, pay taxes, and contribute to their communities. They aren't a drain on society. They really do want to work hard. Think about it. They, they left something from home. They might be a lawyer. They might be a doctor. All of these things, they get here, they start over. They want that back. Unfortunately, the process to that would be a very long road to start all of that over in the US. However, they want access to education and great jobs when they get here. So a little bit more about the global refugee crisis, just to paint the big picture. An estimated 60 million men, women, and children are currently displaced worldwide. 750,000 refugees have resettled in the U.S. since 2001, and last year alone, we admitted 85,000 refugees. The top five home countries for those refugees last year were the Democratic Republic of Congo, Syria, Burma, Iraq, and Somalia. So, why are we in Clarkston, Georgia? Why are refugees in Clarkston, Georgia? Well, Luke, when it comes to Luke and I, we actually both really wanted to move abroad when we graduated. We thought that we really wanted to do economic development. We wanted to focus on education and job creation. And what we realized is that the world was in our backyard and it was in Clarkston, Georgia. So Clarkston is just east of the Atlanta perimeter. Um, so it's really close to a ton of jobs and it's called the Ellis Island of the South. The reason is, for the past 30 years, the UN has resettled 2,500 refugees there every year. There are over 145 countries, 761 ethnic groups, and 60 languages spoken in one square mile. That is a new language every 100 square feet. And Time Magazine calls it the most diverse square mile in the country. So we saw a problem, and we created this nonprofit. So having been in construction uh, at that point for a period of time, um, and then at the same time knowing kind of the refugee crisis and what was going on specifically in Clarkston, um, we had the idea to kind of combine, um, to solve one, one major problem, and, one, and actually two major problems um, with, with, with creation of the Lantern Project. Um, specifically in construction, one of the things that um, we specifically see often is that there's a lack of uh, skilled labor a lack of skilled and unskilled labor, um, and specifically five out, of, uh, five out of seven journeymen are actually exiting the workforce, meaning that they're either deciding to retire or due to recession, or in, in many cases, a lack of, of new individuals joining the workforce. Um, we're seeing just a substantial decrease in the amount of unskilled and skilled labor available. Um, and so for Lauren and Jeannie, as a constructor, as a company I was working for, it was both costly and made, made our business very inefficient to um, have to wait long periods of time to staff our company. And then second to that, um, we also began to realize statistics like, like only 5 to 10 percent of refugees will ever go back um, when, they, when, they, when they enter the U.S., ever go back and get a secondary education. Uh, meaning that, like the jobs Mallory mentioned when they first get here, these dead-end, minimum-wage jobs are usually the ones they're going to be stuck in for maybe the, the duration of their time in the United States. They're never going to go back and get an education or go to a, a, a lively career. And then, and then also with that, 49% um, of the refugees that enter the U.S. that have been here for 25 years or more um, will ever uh, actually become proficient in English meaning they're not going out of their immediate network of Somalians and, and, and Congolese and, and Syrians to actually integrate into society, um, learn English, get, get enough English to get better careers along the way. And so they kind of get stuck, again, in this, this, kind of, this kind of survival mode, if you will. Um, and then with that, specifically in Clarkston, we see uh, an incredibly high, oh, I, I skipped over, uh, 
85% of refugees will um, never enter an American-born citizen's home in their lifetime, which is pretty staggering. Um, so you kind of wonder why there's this, you fear what you, what's, what's unknown, you fear what you don't know, and if you've, most, most people in here probably have never even met a refugee, or at least you might not have known you did, um, and they're not entering people's homes. Um, people are not inviting them in. Um, and in Clark, Clarkston specifically, um, they have a twice as high of an unemployment rate um, as the national average, which is pretty staggering. And so with all those facts, you know, we, we, we figured let's, let's dive in deep into an industry that we know needs good people, that there's a, a, a decreasing uh, uh, amount of, of labor available, but there's increase in wages because of the decrease. And so, um, and with a minimal amount of training, we can help put people who normally would not go back and get education, who would get stuck in dead-end jobs, into these higher-paying jobs that have lots of upward mobi mobility. Um, and so we started the Lantern Project, which is certified construction trade training um, through a, a certification called NCCER, which is the National Center for Construction, Education, and Research. Basically, it's the standard in the U.S. for construction. It would be like getting your diploma from Sanford, versus, you know, in the, in the more uh, basic skilled um, trade arena. So our trainers are all journeymen in their own, their own uh, individual um, industry. So, so, for example, this is Brandon Robinson. He's an electrician. And, um, and so he's actually doing both the book work and the, ha the hands-on as well as the book work. And so with that, at the end of every single class, the students have to, to pass um, tests. Um, they have to pass them to move on to the next, the next part of the course. And um, again, once they finish, they're going to get a certification and a, and a, uh, a tangible um, diploma that they can take to any employer in the future, as well as uh, an NCCER card, which is basically a way that any employer can verify um, the types of training they've been through. So again, this is a great way for them to be able to say, I've done welding, I'm a great welder, you know, check me out, and be able to get a great job. Um, one of my favorite parts about the program is we do a mentorship. So as I mentioned, 85% of refugees are never going to enter an American-born citizen's home. And so um, you can imagine, again, the fear, the unknown. You don't know. You, you don't know. You fear what you don't know. And so we partner local leaders with uh, these refugee men and women um, to kind of help them, you know, learn what it takes to, to be an American citizen. Um, you know, just the basics of surviving in the U.S., you know, opening up a bank account, um, you know, can you, can you imagine going to pay taxes when you barely know the language? Um, so it's very difficult situations, obviously, they're going through that the mentors are able to kind of help the mentees. And then, of course, um, really the most dynamic part, which is why we created the Lantern Project in the first place, is that this opens up conversations about Jesus. Um, it opens up opportunities for, um, you know, these young men from um, Nepal who are, are, who are Hindu um, to be able to, to have an intimate relationship, probably the first one they've ever had with an American-born uh, citizen, as well as maybe a first, a first uh, follower of Christ. And so it just allows conversations and relationships to build, hopefully leading to um, you know, long-term relationships that could lead them to Christ, potentially. And so this is a fun picture. Um, we actually, again, like I mentioned, we, we do more the hands-on skill because... You know, just like in any trade or in any, any type of industry, um, experience is, is king. And so we truly, you know, try to make sure that when they finish, they have, you know, hours and hours and hours of experience doing the trade that they've been training for. And so um, this is a fun one because you can just imagine hearing the roar of, of laughter and cheers. This is the first class that was able to actually do electrical and, and complete a circuit for a, a light bulb, which was really fun to see. I mean, that gentleman on the right is actually, his name is Muhammad. He's originally from Afghanistan. Um, and we, on average, our graduates get about a $15,000 a year annual in, uh, increase in, in their income, um, which is obviously pretty significant when most of them are probably only making about $15,000 a year prior to our program. And so Muhammad's a good story where he was making about minimum wage, $8, $8 or so. Um, after finishing our program, he went back and got certification in HVAC as well. And then now he's making, uh, through Amplio, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, is making about $19 per hour as a apartment maintenance tech. And so, again, we, we hire 
uh, journeymen um, in their individual trades. This is Douglas Carter. He's a, our uh, pipe fitting trainer. And so, you know, what's great is we have incredible donors, incredible partners there in Atlanta that help us with equipment that's very costly, with um, really being able to do things safely and do them in a way that's going to represent what they're going to see on a job site. And so it's really fun. Again, we, we, we see incredible um, opportunities to push them beyond just minimum wage jobs and at the same time investing that kind of time and, and energy into someone's life opens up opportunities you know, for conversations, hopefully um, leading to Jesus conversations. So we're going to kind of go over a couple of really cool stories um, that kind of give a tangible um, realistic version of kind of what's happening. So this is Abdullah al-Assad. Um, Abdullah is originally from Palestine. Um, he would say he's actually a citizen of nowhere, which is pretty, pretty sad because as a citizen of Palestine, you're not really a citizen. Um, he ended up, his grandparents ended up as refugees to Iraq uh, years and years and years ago. And um, he lived most of his life in Iraq, basically, as a refugee. And um, so now, fast forward, he was able to leave with his family to relocate to Clarkston. Um, and so one of the coolest parts about Abdullah is that he has this desire more than anything in the world to become a citizen of the United States. And so he's about a year from that happening, and you just see him light up when, it's just when he starts talking about his ability to become a citizen, a citizen for the first time. I mean, it's, it's just incredible. And so he's, uh, he studied uh, carpentry through our program. His very first job, he's working manufacturing, making about $8 an hour. Um, I can say he's making about $50,000 a year now upon finishing our program. We're able, he was able to get a, a job as a construction team lead for a really great company. Um, he's got benefits. His family has benefits for the first time after three years being here, or four years being here. And um, really fun story. His son, Muhammad, he, they came to me one day, and his son, Muhammad, <laughs> wanted to play soccer more than anything in the world for their high school. But they didn't realize even in a public high school, you have to pay dues. So he had to tell his 17-year-old son, I'm sorry, you, know, you can't play. I can't afford it. And so this year will be his first season playing for the local high school because he has this new career. Uh, and this is Francis' bio. Francis is one of my best friends now. Um, Francis, uh, originally from Congo, um, he studied electrical with us and, and uh, welding as well. And um, What's really neat about Francis is he's actually a tailor originally. Him and his entire family were tailors back in, in uh, the Congo and then uh, Uganda where he was a refugee there for years. And so he makes all of his own clothes. He's incredibly, incredibly talented, but he knew that that was kind of a, a dead-end job unless he's going to create a, his own design, designer you know, kind of brand. And so he came to Lantern Project, and um, I was actually his mentor. So when the, in the very first program we had... Um, all of us trainers and people running the organization were all mentors. And I always laugh because I say that Francis mentored me may, way more than I could ever have mentored him. I mean, the stuff that this guy's been through, it's just, you know, through genocide and, and horrible situations in Congo. Um, but it was really great. Last summer, he invited me to be the best man at his wedding in Uganda. Um, so he got engaged while he was still living there and uh, was able to um, pay for the wedding because of his new job. So now he's, he's finished our, our program. He went from making about $9 an hour as a tailor in a, in a plant to now he's making about $14, $15 per hour. Um, and in about a year and a half, he's going to be a certified electrician where the opportunities are about six figures. You know, so it's, for him, it's pretty life-changing. Um, and also, it's really exciting. So his, wa his wife is still in Uganda because he still has, he still has a visa right now. Or he did. But as of about a week ago, he just got his citizenship, which means that the process is going to speed up, and he's going to have his wife here hopefully in the next month. And then this is his son, Saidison Atri. Um, I know you, you mentioned, David mentioned um, what's going on in Iran. Um, Hassan's story is just like that. Um, he grew up in Iran his whole life. Hassan means friend, and um, he's the best friend you'll ever meet if you guys ever get to meet him. And uh, Asan grew up in Iran and, and began to question the validity of, of Muhammad in the Quran. Um, and doing that's very dangerous in Iran. Obviously, when there's secret churches, you, you know, you can't do that publicly. So his family basically told him, you need to leave. You need to go to Turkey and flee. So that's what he did. He fled to Turkey. And um, his first week in Turkey, he had a dream where some man came to him and said, follow me. And he kept coming to him, saying, follow me. And... Uh, 
within a week after that, he actually met a pastor on the street in Turkey who told him, God sent me to you. I need to talk to you. Let's talk. And he explained he kept having these dreams, and he was able to explain that that's Jesus who you're seeing. And so the next, next night, he said Jesus came to him in a dream and said, yeah, you found me. Keep seeking me. And so um, fast forward about a year later, he ended up as a refugee in the U.S., um, where he, so his first job was with Goodwill. He was making about $8.50 an hour or so. But most importantly, he just had no network. He had no friends. He barely spoke English. And he just, he, he just became a believer, and he just felt like, God, what are you doing? I'm, I'm now cut off from everything I, I knew, and I didn't really know anything. And um, so we met him for lan- through Lantern, and um, really funny story. He, his, he just learned English, and he just started a program, and he couldn't control the pitch of his voice or the tone of his, his voice very well in English. And so when he would raise his hand and answer questions, he would yell, like, just yell, and everyone called him Angry Man. So Hassan, who has, you know, is the goofiest, nicest guy you'll ever meet, became Angry Man, which is kind of ironic. Um, but I, I'm happy to say, he, you know, he finished our program in welding. His first job was $19 per hour. Um, he's make, he's uh, actually making furniture for West Elm. Um, it's a, well, it's a company that makes furniture and sells to West Elm. And then you, if you ever get end up in the Falcon Stadium, um, most of the seating is actually welded by him as well. So Amplio recruiting was kind of the next, the next big step between this. We saw, an op- we saw a need um, just, for, just for jobs in Clarkston. Like I said, the unemployment rate is double the national average. And, and including some of the guys coming through Lantern is, you know, they, it's all great. You know, they can come to class in the evening, but what are they doing the rest of the day? How do they provide for their families? And so we knew as well, just in the industry, that blue-collar jobs are out there. And there's a huge need for it. And most staffing companies that are out there are, are pulling from the same labor pool. Um, and so we had this dream. Uh, my business partner uh, originally started two years ago. And then I joined him in January as partners um, to basically pull our labor, our, labor, our labor pool solely from the refugee community. So Amplio is Spanish for ample because we believe there's an ample amount of jobs available. And there's an ample amount of people within the refugee community to, to perform those jobs. And so that's what we go to employers and we try to do. Um, we, we primarily focus on living wage jobs, which in Georgia is about $10 per hour or so. Um, our, ma- our three main industries are manufacturing, hospitality, and construction. So we're working with organizations and companies like uh, the Atlanta Athletic Club, um, House of Cheatham, which makes hair care products, um, Intercontinental Hotel Group, Coca-Cola, a company called Ingent that makes, does anybody here drive a Tesla? <laughs> No, wrong group. Um, so te- te- the headlights on a Tesla, those are made by our guys. Um, they manufacture them in Atlanta, and then they ship them off. So those guys probably never ride in a Tesla, they always tell me, but they get to l- at least touch the headlights of them. Um, and and part, of, part of the story as well is that we know from working within the refugee community that these are the most reliable individuals you ever meet. You know, they're hardworking, and then they're legal. You know, so typically in this in this specific blue collar types of jobs, these are th- these are three attributes you, you, that you don't find, especially for these ten dollar an hour you know paying jobs. Um, and then on top of that, they're educated and they're experienced. Um, most of them are coming with backgrounds, um, with doctorates, and we've had we've had we've had doctors, um, surgeons, nurses, um, profess- college professors, um, you know, leaders in the community that just had to start over that are willing to do whatever it takes to help their families, if, even if that means you know, uh, shoveling dirt and you know, just, just having to do dirty work. They're, they're ready for it, and they're willing to do it because they're safe, and their families are safe. So this was supposed to be a really cool video, so you can just imagine it right now. Um, but basically, we, um, we've been working with, with the uh, Atlanta Athletic Club since last January, and uh, has anyone has anyone been to Atlanta Athletic Club here? So a couple people. It's uh, one of the oldest um, and most exclusive country clubs in all the country, um, and we've been we've been working with them since January. But it's really great because especially if you knew the environment, it's not. I wouldn't say it's one that is traditionally open to multinationals and to that type of community. <coughs> And through Peter Loveless, who was the club manager at that point, um, we're able to staff about uh, 12 Burmese men. And if anyone knows kind of what's going on in, in Burma, um, 
you know, it's, it's just great being able to put them in a safe environment where they can make money. So 12 Burmese men are basically doing all the groundskeeping for the entire facility. They are uh, you know, making sure that people can golf. That's kind of their job. We've got another 12 that are actually washing dishes and taking trash out. And we've, we've got about four or five uh, cooks. So basically, if you walk on that, on that campus, you're going to be affected by our employees one way or another. And what Peter kind of talks about in the video is more or less how even having refugees, hiring refugees and bringing them into his organization has not only helped their output, I mean, that's typically what we see is an increased output by the, by the workforce, but actually a kind of renewed culture. Um, you know, people who, who have kind of traditionally been, um, you know, looked at in a negative way, you know, kind of this open-minded mindset and where people are working harder and even our people are pushing the other employees to kind of do things with a smile on their face, especially in hospitality. So we want to tell you a few stories about um, some of the individuals that have been affected by Amplio recruiting and basically just the, the ways that they found refuge through their new jobs. So this person, Gol, he's from Afghanistan and like a lot of people that come through the doors, they are here because they were a translator, a culture, cultural expert in Afghanistan. They were working with our military. And as you can imagine, that can be pretty dangerous. So um, not only was he helping our military, but he was an entrepreneur over there. He had a couple of convenience stores and things like that. But he lost a ton of friends to terrorism, both in the Afghan army and our own army. Um, and he, because he was helping America, lived a really dangerous lifestyle. And so occasionally, Actually, often he would get phone calls from block numbers, and it would be the CIA saying, don't go home. We've relocated your family. We'll come get you. And so they just moved around like that because he was helping us. And so after a few events like that, he started to really fear for his family's lives. And so he was given a special immigrant visa to come to the U.S. He, once you work for five or more years, it becomes easier for for, for our government, they'll relocate you here if it gets dangerous. And so it did, and when they came to the U.S., he came through the Lantern Project's carpentry, carpentry program. And after he graduated, he got a job as a crew leader with a construction company, and then he became a project manager. And what's really cool is now he's making $22 an hour, and so he's making great money, but what he wants to do is start his own company. So he wants to start his own construction company, and Amplio will be partnering with him in the spring to make that happen. This is Esther. She's from Burma, and um, her story is that um, as a Muslim and an ethnic minority in Burma, she and her family constantly feared for their lives. And so she and her husband and her two children recently fled to the US as refugees. And so something that happened really sad when they got here is, and it's actually common that depression, PTSD, her husband became an alcoholic and became abusive to her and her children. So even though she thought that she was safe here, she really wasn't safe in her own home. So a local NGO helped remove her and her kids from the situation. But unfortunately, because her English was so bad and she didn't have a job, her kids were quickly put into the foster care system. And so that's when she found Amplio Recruiting. And um, after her first week on the job, got to write a letter to the court saying that she is gainfully employed and can support her family. And so now they live together in a new apartment and are living their lives and are thriving for the first time in a long time. So this is Najib. Um, and Najib is originally from Afghanistan as well, like Gol. Um, and much like Gol's story, and like Mallory said, the story is a lot of Afghani men. He served alongside our military, lost many friends on both sides of, of, of the military to terrorism. And um, after years of doing this, they, the Taliban actually begins to recognize who's in leadership within the Afghan army, and they'll target them and their families. And so that's exactly what happened with Najib. And um, Najib came one, home one day and found out that the Taliban had mistakenly murdered his father, thinking it was Najib. So that was kind of the last, the last time that Najib could do this anymore. So he talked to uh, the gentleman on the right, Sergeant Gonzalez, who was at that point 
who Najib was serving as a translator for, um, high up in the, high up in uh, the army, and asked him, you know, can you help me? I, I need to I need to leave this. I've I've done my time. It's, I think he'd been six years serving the military. I, I need to take my family somewhere safe. And he said, I'm going to do everything I can to help you. So fast forward about a year, Najib and his family were able to receive SIVs, the special immigrant visas, and eventually ended up in uh, in Clarkston. And I met Najib because he, within a few months of him arriving, because his passion is wood carving. Um, he's, a, he's a beautiful wood carver. He had businesses back in Afghanistan, and he didn't have space um, to do his, his passion. So he had heard about Lantern Project and figured, you know, we're a construction training program. Why don't I just go bum off of them and use our facility? And so he came in day after day after day and just used our facility, and we became very close friends. And one, uh, one morning, he came, he came to the office and walked in my office and said, Luke, I, I really want to thank somebody in your government for allowing my family and I to, to live, to escape and to live. Um, and I, I drew this up, and it was a congressional seal. And I was like, Najib, you might want to think about doing maybe a congressional seal. He did a presidential seal at first. Sorry, what did I say? Yeah, he did a pres presidential seal at first. And I said, eh, Najib, you might want to think about doing a congressional seal. That might, that might make it a little bit uh, easier to get to somebody's hands. And so um, he, sure enough, about two or three weeks later, he came to, to my office with this. He hand-carved this congressional seal. It took him about 70 hours, 70 hours of constant, you know, constant, constant um, carpentry. And um, so I, immediately I said, we, we got to get this in the right person's hands. And so on World Refugee Day this last March, we were able to present this to the governor of, of, of Georgia, uh, and then two or three mayors, and then a few congressmen. And now it sits in a congressman's office in D.C. Um, and they have a big plaque below it with Najib's story. And it's been on CNN, and they use it as, as representation of, like, the men that are coming from Afghanistan. And then the, the other part to Najib I don't want to skip over is um, the day that him and I presented the seal, and we, got, we drove over to this congr congressman's office, he looked at me and said, um, gosh, I'm about to lose it, um, he looked at me and said, are all Christians this way? You know, do, do all Christians love this way? And, uh, you know, so we're able to really, really talk about what, it, what, what does it look like to be a follower of Jesus? And so he's, uh, he's, he's, he's on his way to becoming a follower of Jesus. He, he, he loves Jesus, you know, so we can debate about what that looks like, but he's a Muslim who loves Jesus. So we did have a kind of a cool overview video of Amplio recruiting. You can actually go to the website and watch it, but it was kind of like a day in the life of a refugee in Clarkston, like them getting up, them getting ready for work, and what makes them different, um, and why they're an asset to the workforce. But um, you can watch that later. So AmplioRecruiting.com. Um, so we wanted to talk about a few takeaways, like what does this mean for creating refuge um, for refugees. How can we do that? You don't have to be a staffing company to be able to do that. So some things that we thought about were just meeting your local refugee community. Whether or not there are refugees exactly where you live, every big city has um, a ton of NGOs or we'll have a resettlement agency for refugees. Ask them how you can get involved with them or a nonprofit that supports them. You could come to Clarkston. We would love to have you. It's, it honestly feels like you're in a different country. I don't know which one, but all of them. <laughs> um, you will see women walking down the street carrying baskets on their head. You will see a little bit of everything, and it's really a cool place to be. So if you come, we'll show you around and would love to tell you more about it. Um, and I think the most important one is, is invite them into your home. When you find a refugee, invite them into your home because it's something that Again, 85% of them will never experience in their lifetime, even after being here. So um, Luke and I do that consistently, and, and they do it to us even more. Just They treat us like family, and so just creating that for them is something that they may never experience. And on that note, just be willing to have an open-minded conversation with them about their faith. They really want to talk about it, but keep in mind that they're probably fleeing a place that persecuted them because of it. So really hard sometimes as Christians to not say like think with a I want to convert you mindset but we have developed so many great relationships 
that start with us just listening and them feeling like we're a safe place to where they end up saying things like that. Like, I've never met a Christian that treated me like this. That's why they're here. They're fleeing something. And it might have been Christians that were persecuting them in the first place. So just being willing to invite them in and be open-minded and listen and create that safe space, love them like Christ would, is really the best thing that you could be doing for them while they're here. And if you ever own a business in the future, consider hiring refugees. Um, they're incredible. And sometimes there's a communication barrier. But, you know, you kind of just have to laugh about it and just say, they're trying so hard. Like, I'll take that any day, um, the hard work ethic, and just work a little bit on communication. It's definitely worth it.